Howdy folks, my name is Raul Verma, and I'm going to be going over Rust Basics today for CSM20 Honors. So today our goal to, is to talk about the basic data types in Rust, mutability, control flow, and conditional set of loops. So let's start by talking about what data types are. Data types are the method by which we tell the compiler what type of data it's storing. And they're built into the compiler so users can just access them with predetermined keywords. These are often keywords that you've heard before, integers, floating points, booleans, characters, tuples, and arrays. And if you aren't familiar with these terms, don't worry, we'll get into what they are. So there are two primary types of data types, scalar data types and compound data types. Conceptually, all you really need to understand is that scalar data types, like integers, floating points, and booleans, and characters, are all singular data types. They only take in a single value and store a single value. Whereas compound data types store multiple values, Tuples and arrays both store complex and various amounts of data, which allows you to access various amounts of data at the same time, hence compound in their name. So integers are the way we express numbers in Rust. There are two main ways other than integers, which are floating points and doubles, but both of those are used for decimal representation, whereas integers are always used for the classic integer representation that you've learned to math. The key thing to note about integers is because they don't store decimals, they inherently truncate decimals. And what that means is because anything after the decimal point is essentially ignored, it is just always rounded down. So 11.8 in, in integer form is just 11. So as you can see here, there's a sizes for our integers. Let me move my camera so you can take a look. There are default sizes for integers in Rust, and Rust asks you to specify what type of integer size you're using. The classics are 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit, and 128-bit, and then arch. The default integer size is 32. We recommend for that all purposes you just use 128. And if you don't specify, Rust will automatically decide which size is best for you. So there are some basic ways to declare uh, an integer. So we can see here that this is an incorrect way of declaring it, and this is how you do it in, say, C++ or Java. And these are the, probably the primary programming languages you've encountered in the past. So you'll definitely make this mistake. What you should know is that instead of doing with an int keyword, what we do in Rust is we use the main let x colon i32. So let is the keyword for declaration, and the i32 is the type declaration. We can also not declare our type. We can just say let x equals 5 and our compiler will take care of the type declaration portion for us. So this is important to know. First, that we're keywording let in order to declare our variable, and then we don't necessarily have to declare a type, but if we do, we use the colon to specify what exactly our type of our variable is. Now, the other thing is that the size specified in the declaration tells the compiler how much space it needs to allocate to its memory. And this makes your code significantly more efficient because you can optimize for your memory usage, you can optimize for your variable usage. This isn't necessary for this class, but it becomes a relevant factor in classes like CS341 or CS421 when you guys eventually take them. The memory allocated is uh, according to the length in the table. The range of the integer's value go from its value negative two to the power its length minus one to two to the power its length minus one minus one. Now that sounds like a very abstract formula, but there's a very easy way to analogize it. For example, i to the power 8, uh, or i8, has a range of negative 128 to 127. We can see this because uh, to negative 2 to the power 8 is negative 128. And sorry, it should be negative of 2 to the power 8 is negative 128. And 2 to the power 8 is 128 minus 1 is 127. And unsigned ints cannot be negative, so the range starts at 0. Sorry. And uh, it's worth noting here that um, 8. I, 2 to the power 8 is actually 256, but 2 to the power 7 is 128, hence the math there. So floating points are the same thing as your decimals. There are two types of floating points, F32, which is a single decimal value precision, aka only the first value will be kept as most important and everything else may not be entirely accurate, or double decimal precision, which is F64. This is the more precise work uh, version of float, but also has significantly more storage overhead. Floats work just like ints do, and you just, they, the amount of data they store depends on their decimal, and the higher number generally, the more precise. And you don't have to use the keyword, uh, you don't have to use the type version, you do have to declare them with let. 
So Rust supports mathematical operations, and they're all the default operation signs that you know of. You can see on the right, sum is plus, difference is minus, multiplication is the star, division is the slash, and remainder or uh, is just the percentage sign. And Rust automatically assigns types to variables whose type is not completely specified. So you can see here we have let sum equals 5 plus 10. Both of these are integers, so sum is by default considered an integer of type I32. Let difference from N95.5 minus 4.3 is by default a float because both these values are floats. Same with product, uh, by default integer, by default a float for quotient, by default integer for floored, and by default an integer for remainder. So it, as you can see, it doesn't support, uh, at any point, we've never done any form of operation between a float and an integer. And that is because Rust does not inherently support operations between float and integers. And you may be asking, why is that? If we take an integer and we just add a 0, 0.0 at the end, it has become a float. And then we can do the same operation. Yes, and that's essentially what we call typecasting, where you convert an integer to a float or a float to an integer, and then you do the operation and then convert into whatever type you want your end result to be. Uh, and you can do that very easily, but the most easy, the most simple way is essentially just to put float and then parentheses and whatever you want to typecast in. So Rust has inbuilt types for both characters and strings, but string declaration and usage is significantly more complex than what we cover in this video. Uh, characters in cars, basically, are what we use to primarily store single alphabetical pieces of data. And they're represented with the, the keyword char, car, and are declared with a pair of single quotes. And Rust is a far more diverse and powerful character language type than other languages. And this is because of how sizes of data types work. So as we've covered in like floats and integers, you can declare how much data you want them to store. Characters are a little bit special. In other languages, characters are single bytes. In other words, they have very limited range of what they can store. This allows them essentially to store the ASCII uh, select strings. But uh, in Rust, characters are four bytes, which means we get significantly more type expression in our characters. So we can store emojis and special characters like Japanese letters. As you can see here, we have a let care Z, let Z colon, sorry, let C care equal Z, let Z and then type care with an explicit annotation equal in italicized Z. And then we can have a let heart eyed cat and we just put an emoji in there. So the other thing, the other main data type for singular is booleans. These are used for true false and they're pr primarily used in control flow and they're used to evaluate uh, like flags. So did I achieve this condition or is this condition true? And they're also one byte in size because there's only two values they can store, true and false. So you can see here the two ways of declaring our booleans, let t equals true, let f bool equals false. So next let's talk about a concept called mutability. So Rust is very different from other languages in how it handles its data. Uh, programming languages like C++ and Java have something called memory management systems. In C++, the system is called the pointer. And in uh, Java, the system is the garbage collector. Rust doesn't have an equivalent per se. And so to make sure that its data is protected and isn't deleted essentially by the compiler unnecessarily, it inherently tries to protect its data at compile time. It wants to make sure that its data is in use by one person and cannot be edited by someone by accident. And by default, it makes your declared variable something called immutable which just means that once you declare a variable, it is bound to its assigned value forever. That's all the word immutable means. And if you wanna change your data at any point, you cannot use an immutable data type. You have to use a mutable data type. And to make a mutable data type, you have to use the keyword mute when declaring your variable. And this is true for all variable types, whether it's a float, a Boolean, an integer, whatever, you have to use the keyword mute. And an example of this is below, let mute x equals five. Now we can change the value of x at any point in the future. So we can see another example here where we do the changing. Let mute x equals f64 5.2. The value of x is, we print it, we'll get 5.2. Then we say x equals 6.7. When we print it, we'll get 6.7. So next let's talk about conditionals. All conditionals are evaluated with Boolean logic and you can use a Boolean expression for this. And the conditionals are if 
else if, and else. There is no elif if you're familiar with C++. All contents of a condition must be within curly braces. And if the conditions are fundamental expressions, so you can basically do some really creative things with your if conditions. So let's start looking at the three examples that we have on the page. So first we have let number equals three, and then we can do the easy one. If number is not equal to zero, print number with something other than zero. This is a very straightforward if condition where we have our expression, our Boolean expression right here, and we're purely evaluating to whether if this statement is true or false. Now, if we look at the next one, we get let condition equals true, because we know that this is a Boolean condition and this values to a Boolean expression essentially, which is just true. Then we say let number if condition five, else six. And then because condition just checks if it's true, then we can say number is equal to five if this condition is satisfied. Otherwise, number is equal to six. In this case, number is five. So the value of number will be five. And then we can do the same thing with let condition true if five else six. And essentially what's going on here is that these two don't have the same type, but because of how Rust compiler works, it evaluates what type of the variable is at its declaration. So first this condition is checked, this value is inserted, and then Rust's compiler looks at the value that is inserted here and checks to see what its type should be. So if condition is true, then number's type is an I32. Else, if six is true, so condition is false, then number would be a string. So you can do some really interesting things with if condition depending on how you use them and how you use your uh, Boolean expressions to place your if conditions in the correct place. Next, let's talk about loops. There are three main ways to implement loops. The loop statement, which is essentially used to repeat indefinitely until a break statement is reached. A while loop, which is essentially also used to loop until a condition is reached. And a for loop, which is used to iterate through a certain number of iterations. And you can use an enhanced for loops to iterate through elements of like a vector or an array. So here below, we have examples of our uh, main two loops that we actually will be using in this course, while loops and for loops. So you can see let mute three equals number, while number is not equal to zero, print number, number minus equals one, and then at the end, print left off. The thing with while loops is that you can often unintentionally create an infinite while loop. If we remove number minus equals one, this code will iterate forever trying to get number equal to zero, but it never will. It'll just keep on looping because number is not decrementing or say number is for whatever reason an immutable, we'll have the same issue. We can hear in for loops, we can see an example of an enhanced for loop on the right, which is uh, for i in and one dot dot four. This is the way you declare essentially a range of, uh, of iterations you wanna go through. So you can go from one, two, four. Left side is inclusive, the right side is non-inclusive. So this would go one, two, three, and then it would quit. And here we see another enhanced for loop, specifically for iterating through the elements of an array. We have let a equals 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And for element in a, we'll get a print of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So that's all for today's lecture. Reminders, there is Rust extra practice in our Prairie Learn that will be being released today. There is also the Rust textbook if you want to follow along with our content on the Rust official documentation. You can just click on this link and you can see that it takes you to the documents of the Rust language. And it's this is the common textbook that we'll be using for this course. Homework one is being released next week. So look out for that and best of luck. Feel free to reach out to us on Discord if you need any help. Thank you everyone for watching.